Hey folks, this is Hal Shirtliff with Camp Constitution, and I am here with Mr. Bill Glennie, who's 90 years young today. It's early May of 2018, and we are in uh, western Massachusetts in the beautiful city of Chicopee, where he currently resides. And Mr. Glennie has an incredible story. He was a guard at Nuremberg Prison. He was involved with the very first round of the major uh, war criminals. Uh, so, Bill, tell us a little bit about yourself before you uh, before we discuss your experiences at Nuremberg. Oh, okay. Uh, well, I was uh, 18 years old when I uh, was drafted. That's in 1945. I was 18, and uh, I wanted to get in the service. You know, I could have played with the army band at Westover Field, right? Right here but in the. I, uh, I didn't want to play with the band. I wanted to go overseas where the action was. I just wanted to, to see some action, which I did. Of course, when the trials were over, these men hung and the trials were over, I did qualify to play with the Army band, and I did end up my career in the service playing with the 1st Division Army band. Mm -hmm. a great, and a boy, I've had. Had it made if you played the band? You how many know, How many years did you serve in the U.S. Army? Uh, oh, I, I went in in nineteen forty-five. Was was drafted September, somewhere around November, and I got out somewhere in, in uh, nineteen forty-seven. So you did your three years, basically three oh, no, years. No, no, I think it went three years. Uh, I went in for. Uh, a little less than two years. Oh, oh really? Okay. Yes, yeah. yes. I got out and, and I was 47. And uh, it was quite an experience. And you married your, your, your sweetheart. That's right. And uh, you worked at the Springfield Armory here, in, um, which is now a museum. Exactly. The home of the M1 Garand, among other uh, fine weapons. Oh, yes. And I, I met Mr. Garand himself. Did you really? Yeah. yeah. Because he Fascinating. lived in Springfield. I was over his house. And I got his autograph. I really? I have the last armor that came out of the Springfield Armory. I have the last armor. There's quite a little section in there that tells you about the M1 mm -hmm. and Garant. And I had him sign it, his autograph. That's that. wonderful. So I've got one of the very few copies of the last armor all signed by the, by the, the general that was there at the time. There's a colonel that was there, signed by all these people, and it's a document. And it closed, the army closed, what, and about it, 68 or 69, uh, somewhere around there? Uh, yeah, yeah, somewhere around there, I don't remember exactly. So now, you that. got to, uh, by the time you did your training, you were in Germany, and it was uh, February of 1946. Re exactly. And the exactly. trial was already several months, it got underway, what, November of 45? Yes. And yes. there were 21 of the um, Nazis that 21. were on trial? major war criminals that uh, were represented at the trials. Mm -hmm. There was more than that, but they weren't there, like Martin Borman. He was tried in uh, absentia. He was tried in absentia. Absentia, yeah. Con uh, you know, uh, were found guilty, and if they would have found them, they would have hung them. Now, um, Robert Lay, who was the uh, what, in charge of labor, Yes. Uh, he committed suicide. Chief. He's one of these. Yes, he did. He committed so the first or second week of the, of the trial. Yeah, uh, yes. Well, I was in his cell, you know, I said, how can a person in there, you know, you're being watched 24 hours at the time, but at that time they weren't, they weren't. 24 hours. So you got there in February. So tell us about your initial experiences as a guard and how you end up going to the, uh, guarding the Nuremberg prisoners. Oh, okay. I went in the service and I went overseas, landed at La Havre, France. Got off, and I was indoctrinated to go to to go to Germany and to find out where I was going to be stationed. And my first assignment was not the Nuremberg trials, but it was at uh, it's at this uh, uh, prisoner of war camp uh, that we used to call it Stalag D13 or Langfasser, and I stayed there for a few months, February, March, April, yeah, almost till May, uh, and it was about 20,000 SS men we guarded. Then after we start releasing them, I was, I was relieved of my position there, and I was transferred to the Nuremberg trials to let some of the combat men go home. 
I wound up in Nuremberg with these prisoners. Well, I can tell you a, a little story about Hans Frank, when I guarded Hans Frank. Hans Frank was the governor general of Poland, mm -hmm. brutal man. When they put a rope around his neck to hang him, the last statement he made before he hung was, uh, I am thankful for the kind treatment that I have received while in prison. And I ask God to accept me with mercy. I remember that. Interesting. I Were you there when there. he was hanged? I wasn't there when yeah. he hung. There's very few people. The colonel had very few people there. I got this from one of the reporters from Time magazine. I read the article that he wrote. And I got it from uh, one of the uh, one of the reporters that was there. He was uh, a witness to the hangings, mm -hmm. uh, reporters. So uh, uh, you know, it's it kind of brutal you know, for a man to believe in God, and all of a sudden it's so brutal. This man was terrible. Of course, in Hermann Göring, while well, he was uh, Rudolf Hess was I think, was the most difficult prisoner to. To, uh, and you pretty much guarded all of them at some point because you would you would I seen them all almost every other yeah. day I was there so you would you would be assigned not the same one but no. different ones all the time D yeah. different ones all the time <clears throat> so a typical day would be two hours and you would actually simply watch at w and when they're in the cell you would simply just keep an eye on them the whole time that's it that's it and the colonel uh, before you go on a cell and that's Colonel uh, Andrews Andrews Colonel Andrews had come in and interview you personally. Mm -hmm. He'd interview. So we were going on the cells. There's about, I don't know, three or four guards, maybe maybe five. I don't remember. So we're waiting for the colonel. Uh, so anyway, I, I don't know. We were in this room. So all of a sudden, some lieutenant comes in and screams his lungs off. Attention. My God. And the, this colonel comes in. It's the mm -hmm. way he was. He, he says he wished he could get all men that uh, uh, lieutenants from West Point, you know, they were so well trained. Mm -hmm. And of course, he hate, he was from the old school. You know, anything above his rank, oh, he'd listen to. And he'd do anything below his rank, he squash. You don't tell me what to do. So this is the, that's the old school uh, 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 man he was, and he hated lieutenants. So. Mm -hmm. so anyway, he comes in and he tells us, you men are going to be on the uh, on the cells. He says, your job, you'll be on there two hours on and four hours off for 24 hours. The prisoners aren't allowed to start any lengthy conversations with you. <clears throat> they can ask you what time is it. You can tell them the time, but no lengthy conversation, or you'll be court-martialed. Mm. And uh, the prisoners, when they sleep, they don't sleep with their hands underneath the blankets. You, you put a light in this, this window in the door and you watch them sleep. They don't put their hands underneath the blanket to keep them out and they're supposed to face the light all the time. They can't turn their backs away from the light. You've got to watch them continuously. And they're not supposed to turn their back on you for any length of time. Mm -hmm. You yell at them, tell them to turn around. And, uh, you know, ridiculous rules like this. It's probably duty you didn't particularly like, did you? Oh, no. Yeah. It was ridiculous. Well, the first, the first man I guarded was, uh, was uh, von Franz von Papen. He <clears throat> was probably more responsible for getting Adolf Hitler into power than He had been else. the, wasn't he the chancellor, the chancellor prior yes. to Hitler's ascension? And he got, yes. Yeah. So, uh. I was setting up that uh, my first prisoner was was uh, Franz von Papen, and I was setting up this this light in the window so I could watch him, and I was having trouble trying to get it in. It was the first time we had these little these little wires that we'd put a screen up there, and we had these little pieces of wire that we attached to it so you could hold this light there. Mm -hmm. That was shield around the light like this. So you could watch him. I was having a little trouble with this. <clears throat> so he came up. He came up to me on the other side, and in perfect English, I can. Some things you never forget as mm -hmm. long as you live. 
you know, I was 18 years old, I'm meeting the greatest criminals in history, and I'm actually there with them. So, uh, Franz von Papen comes up and he says to me in perfect English, he said, would you mind shining the light on the other side of the wall? Otherwise, the glare from the light will keep me awake all night. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I thought that was reasonable, but I was so surprised to hear him speak English. He spoke better English. Than perfect that. English, yes. Yeah. Perfect. So he says, uh, no, no, I was a little nervous, you know, I said, my God, this man here, I wonder how many languages he speaks. I so, believe Papin was in New York uh, during, uh, he, he spent some time in the United States. He, yes, yeah. he did. Yeah. He did. He was some kind of a spy. Prior to World War I or during World War, yeah. 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 So anyway, I was turning the light a little, so it shined on the other side, he would get the full glare of the light, it shined it on the other uh, side of the wall. And he said, can I give you a hand? I said, yes. So he was on the inside tightening up these little wires that were holding this light. And we got it set pretty good. And I said, how's that? And he says, that's fine. Mm -hmm. He said, thank you. So he went to bed. So I said, jeez, what a nice guy. Mm -hmm. He didn't look like uh, any type of murder. None of them did, you know. There's and he was actually people. acquitted. He was acquitted at Nuremberg. He was acquitted, yeah. yes. He the was bankers acquitted. usually get away with these kinds of things, don't they? Yes. Well, now you were... Um, three of them that were acquitted, actually. Yeah. And, and he was uh, he was one of them. And, uh, well, anyway, he went to bed, and all of a sudden, you know, he... Uh, his hands were on, on the outside like that, and all of a sudden he puts one hand underneath the blanket, so I'm looking, I said, well, that's against the rules. Mm -hmm. I'm not supposed to do that. And I said, well, what am I going to do? Tell him to take the hand out and he'll, he'll be doing this all night. Mm -hmm. So I didn't say anything. Then he put the other hand underneath. So he was sort of conning me to see what, I, what he could get away with. I guess I don't know. So I'm saying to myself, you know, I always, I grew up like that, you know, going to parochial school and sisters. I said, I would never do anything that I would be, wouldn't be able to do myself. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to sleep in front of a light like that, or, or I'd have to put my hands underneath the blanket. You know, so I said, that's, mm -hmm. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna say anything. If anybody comes by, I say, oh, he just put his hands under there. Then I'd yell. You know, I, I had always a, a good excuse. So anyway, he puts the other hand underneath, and I said, no, he's breaking the rules. Mm -hmm. I could get court martial easy for this. Mm -hmm. So I says. The heck, let him sleep. I says, I, I can't, I wouldn't be able to sleep like that. Right. Then he turns away from the light. That was another. And I says, I, I couldn't sleep in a light like that myself. So I, he broke me in the right way. After that, he, he sort of uh, gave me an idea what to do. What the other prisoner I was in that strip. Neither were the other guards. Mm -hmm. and look, I don't so think it's an American, it's not the American way, so to speak, no, to be no. that way. Now, you mentioned that Hess was the most difficult prisoner. What uh, was your experience with, uh, with Hess? Uh, Rudolf Hess. <clears throat> well, true, uh, true Gilbert. No, Gilbert was a psychiatrist. A psychiatrist, you know. He, uh, uh, he mentioned that I had an idea of, of what, what I was going to get, uh, you know, from Rudolf Hess. As a matter of fact, the captain of the guard said nobody got uh, Rudolf Hess's autograph. Well, he's wrong. I got it. You got I'm it. sure some other people got it, you know. I'm not the only one. Uh, so uh, he mentioned that, uh, like, like I mentioned, he says, Rudolf Hess, he says, uh, I, in layman's term, he put it like this, if the rogue was the sanity and the sidewalk insanity, Rudolf Hess is walking on the curb. On the curb, yeah. So he's not balanced. His mind is not quite there. And the, uh, the psychologist, psych psychologist put it like this. He says, in, in layman's terms, Rudolf Hess has got what you call a deteriorating mind. Mm -hmm. He could be perfectly normal for maybe five minutes. Mm -hmm. And then he comes completely gone, you know. 
So uh, I've got, I got, had an idea, uh, you know, I got to catch him at the right time. So when I went to get his autograph, I says, by that time I had these little pieces of paper. And he spoke pen. some English too, wasn't he? Was he fluent in English no, or he spoke I, some? I, I don't believe he no. spoke English. If he did, it was very little. I, yeah. I never heard him speak English. Well, anyway, I went up to the cell and I says, Hess, Hess. You know, and he turns around and he says, your autograph, you know, I was putting this in the window, in front of the window, autograph, autograph, so mm -hmm. you know what I meant. Uh, nine, nine, and he's yelling, yeah. nine, nine, nine. So I said, oh, Jesus, I better not catch be in it's trouble. just a bad time. <laughs> yeah. Yes. You know, get court martial for this. So I put the pen away, so I asked again, you know, no, no, it's not from me, you know, that. and I finally got him. You know, it says, not from me, for officer, officer. Oh. Five, and he, he's looking like that, aren't he? And he comes over and he grabs it. He signed his autograph and gave it to me. That's so I, I had to wait for the right time to get him. And then I told him for the officer, and uh, uh, I got it. Now, uh, you also uh, had a, you, you knew, you met Goring there. You guarded yes. him for a while. Yes. <clears throat> and yeah. tell us a little bit about your, your, um, your experiences with Herman Goring. Oh, when, when I first met Herman Goring, you know, I was coming down, and they had all the 21 major war criminals in one cell, mm -hmm. one the block. There's, there's three uh, three floors to the prison. All the major war criminals were put on the first first floor, the first tier, the first yeah. dock. You know, so they all they were all numbered off there. So when I see when I seen Goring, you know, I when I first went down there, they had the name plates over the cell doors. And I looked, I seen cell number five was Herman Goring. So I said, oh, there's Herman Goring. So I went over to see Herman Goring, and he was sitting in his car, smoking a pipe and reading a paper. And uh, I looked in the, uh, the window in the door. It's a wood door with a window, and so, like I said, about 15 inches square, 20 inches, somewhere around there. And uh, I looked in there, I said, so that's Herman Goring. Well, he doesn't look like such a big man in prison. You know, right away Goring mm -hmm. comes around and starts staring at me. And he uh, uh, <clears throat> giving me these dirty looks and that, you know, I'm, and I'm, I'm continuing. And I says, well, look at that. Huh? I says, what, what's he going to do in prison? You know, there's nothing much he can do now. He's not a big man. And the guard pulled me, uh, grabbed me by my coat, my little jacket. He pulled me back and he says, Goring can speak English. He says, if he turns you in, you can get court martial. So I said, well, I better keep my big mouth shut. <laughs> then I went over to Von Poppen, who was my first. Now, first Goring teacher. was, uh, when, he was a, when he was first surrendered, he was grossly overweight and he was uh, on various narcotics, an yes. addict. Uh, but the colonel there codeine. I think it was, was a codeine. But I, I understand that he lost a lot of weight in jail and uh, got that. off the drugs, right? Yes. Yeah. And when he did that, his you know his mind turned right back, really sharp. They probably should have left him on a drugs or drugs, you know, because when they start, they they took them. He was taking something like twenty. Uh, pills a, a wow. day or whatever, these paracodines. Because he was and, wounded in World War I, and I think that's what led him to the, initially to the, the addiction. Yeah, probably, yes. So uh, anyway, they, they finally got him off this, and when he did, and of course, then he only ate just a certain amount of food. When we used to feed them, we'd have like a potato, a vegetable, maybe meat, little meat. Everybody got the same share, portion. So Goring naturally started losing weight. Mm -hmm. When he started losing weight, his mind started coming back, and he he got very very uh, uh, interested in the trial, and it, it got so that he was a brilliant man. He was really a brilliant man. Now you've been asked this, I'm sure, numerous times. But what is your um, theory, if that's the right word, on how Goring got the poison, the uh, cyanide? Well, and this was what two hours before he was supposed to be hanged. Somewhere around there. Yeah. You know. uh, when Goring was captured, he had three capsules with him. The first one, three cyanide capsule, and the capsules. As a matter of fact, I took a picture. Uh, I've got a picture. 
of the capsule that uh, he committed suicide with. Mm -hmm. This this Dr. Uh, Latimer got this from uh, Tex Wheelis, who who had it, first had it. No, it's it's Tex Wheelis. Uh, Te Tex Wheelis. Mm -hmm. He was at the uh, he was uh, at the Nuremberg. And he was a a, 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 a private a lieutenant. He was okay. a lieutenant. Yeah. And uh, oh wait a minute. Uh, Goring had three capsules. He allowed the first one to be found. So he said, oh, we got the capsule, now we don't have to worry. Mm -hmm. He had two others. The second, <clears throat> the second one he committed suicide with. The third one he had in the jar of face cream. Mm. Because this, the second one he wrote, when he took it, he took it and uh, committed suicide, but he left a note stating that he had a third one that was located in his jar of Vaseline, hmm. where uh, they checked, and there was there was. <clears throat> now, who found his um, who found him in the cell? When, oh, after he committed suicide. Well, oh, okay. Yeah. When he when he took the, the cyanide, you know, the guard noticed. Oh, you know, he uh, just choked up and he started. It acts know, right fast. Yeah, you know, he was moving around and he couldn't breathe and he. And a guard called and he yelled, something's wrong with going, something's wrong with going. But by the time they got there, it was too late, he was dead. He was dead. So I had no idea. <clears throat> but there wasn't any evidence or enough evidence to, um, to indict anybody, to um, accuse uh, anybody. No, they, the investigation wasn't that. They just wanted to get the trials over when mm -hmm. we were having trouble with the Russian airlift at the time. So let's get this over. Let's, yeah. And they didn't even... They didn't even interview Tex Wheelers. They didn't interview. Uh, well, all they all they found are pieces of. Uh, they found a little capsule that this uh, this tube of uh, cyanide was in, and little pieces of glass when mm -hmm. he bit into it. Mm -hmm. So they uh, they got evidence that he had this little this little tube. And it was just like a, a lipstick, a tube of lipstick, a vial, except yeah. it was a, a capsule, you know, like a, from a bullet. You take a cap off, mm -hmm. and inside was the glass jar of cyanide. You know, and you just I bite it. And, yeah. And but uh, Tex had a watch. Herman Goering gave Tex his oh, watch. He gave him a watch. <laughs> he gave him a pair of gloves. He was very friendly. The night of the hangings. This is this is give you an idea. Probably how, because I was asked, do you think that uh, he could have had this capsule on him all all the while he was in prison? Mm -hmm. No. No, he couldn't have. And Goring says he, he kept it up his, up his rectum, you mm -hmm. know, he put it in his high, but no. I said, if, if he left this or in a cell, okay, he could leave it in the cell, but if he left the cell, go to the courtroom, we could take his belongings, put it in another cell, and when he'd come back, he wouldn't see that cell. Mm -hmm. So, this is impossible. And to put him in a high boots, you would have seen it. You, you, I, I went in the, uh, I went in the prison. In other words, when the uh, prisoners go to the courtroom, we release, we release them to go to the courtroom. And we go inside the cell to search it. Mm -hmm. All they have is a change of clothes, that's all. And I looked at the bowl, you know, the, I went with a sergeant and looked, and so he says, "Look at the uh, look at uh, look at the bowl." So I looked inside the bowl, and I couldn't see uh, I couldn't see anything. There's a rim around the around the bowl, and I says, "I can't see up there." And I said, "I can't put my hands." You know, I don't want to put my hair. I've got to have some gloves. He said, "Never mind. That's all right. Maybe he could have had it up there, but I doubt it." Uh, the way he got the cell is he got a hold of Tex Wheelis. This, this was verified by his son, Tex Wheelis. Tex Wheelis' son said, if it wasn't for my father, Herman Goring would have hanged at Nuremberg. Mm. So that's sure. And so. I said, if it wasn't for Tex, uh, that Tex Wheelis did have something to do with procuring this mm. cyanide. So Goring must have told Tex, look, I have uh, face cream or whatever. He had, Goring had a whole, a whole pile of luggage in a baggage room which was held in two cells, all the prisoners there. Mm -hmm. 
had two cells where they put all their uh, their belongings. So he probably told Tex, you know, Tex probably went with him to the baggage room, and Tex is the only one. We we didn't have any bolts or locks on the doors. All we rather we didn't have any keys or locks. You know, it was just a bolt that you slam open over mm -hmm. the door. So it was easy to get in and get it. It was pretty easy to get it. Uh, well, Tex had to have the key for the baggage room. Oh, I see. Yeah. So Tex probably let him in a baggage room. Go ahead, get what you want. Go mm. and took the pill. Uh, came back. Now he had maybe for a couple of hours mm. until he decided this is the time to take it. That's, from the that um, sense. from the time of the verdicts to the hangings, how many days was it? It was pretty quick, though, wasn't it? it was it a matter of a few it days? Seven, it, no, it was it was. Probably a week or so. A week, it was, yeah. was quite a, quite a while. It wasn't, now, it wasn't two or three days. What was the difference in the in the demeanor from from before the verdict to after the verdict? Because quite a few of them were hanged. There were some that were acquitted and some got jail sentences. Oh yes, there were uh, eleven were condemned to hang, mm -hmm. with the exception of Goring, who committed suicide, and uh, seven of them, I believe. Uh, jail sentences. Receive, uh, receive uh, lesser prison terms. Mm -hmm. Three were acquitted. 17, 18, 19, 20, 21. Uh, 21. Or eight, or eight were uh, received. Uh, well, three were acquitted anyway. And uh, and uh, Chirac and Spear got 20 years in prison. Mm -hmm. I believe or eight are. 10. Was it 10? 10 years. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And Donuts got, I think, 10 years. Uh, 10 years, yeah. yes. Yeah. Donuts, yes. I yeah. think he, he was the... Uh, he was the one that Hitler, the, after uh, Hitler was uh, gone, he, he put in his will, he made him head of the Third Reich. And I thought, what a yeah. terrible thing to inherit, you know? Of exactly. <laughs> all the things to inherit. And it was I his job to surrender. Yeah. What prisoner, what are the prisoners uh, made, made of, and what made the biggest impression? Were there anyone that you would say, I'll never forget this person? Well, Herman Goering. Herman Goering. If you met Herman Goering, you'd never forget him. He was the most dominating figure in there. Mm -hmm. Everybody looked at Herman Goering. He was the boss, so, so to speak. He's the boss, <clears throat> and he's going to be the boss. And in prison, he's still the boss. Mm. So what he said, he expected everybody to go along with him. As you said, said, you met like you met von Poppen, and he seemed like a very likable person. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Julius Stryker was another. Now he was. Even among the Nazis, they were embarrassed by him. Yeah. Some of the uh, top Nazis. What What can you tell me about uh, Julius? Well, uh, Julius Stryker couldn't speak English. Mm -hmm. When I was getting autographs, I started getting the autograph. I, I went to get his autograph. So I said, Julius, Julius. I don't know if I call him Julius or Stryker or what. Julius. He, he turned around and I said, autograph, autograph. Mm -hmm. And he says, uh, how did he put it? He says, cow gummy. Cow, he wanted some cow gummy. I never forgot that word. You know what cow gummy no. is in German? No. <clears throat> cow gummy is chewing gum. Oh, okay. And he wanted some, he, most of them will ask for cigarettes. Mm -hmm. But uh, he had a big water chew, uh, gum mm. he used to chew in his cell. And cow gummy, cow gummy. And I says, I don't have any now. I autograph, I'll get it after, I'll get it after, mm -hmm. you know. So anyway, I conned him in to him getting his autograph, it's on it. He gave me his autograph, he never got the choice. Never got the gum, oh, never so got you got it over. Yeah, uh, you have, <clears throat> you actually have the, um, this is a copy, of course, you can just hold it on holding it up. This is so the, uh, the various okay. uh, signatures. And uh, this is the way the... Uh, all right, let's see. We'll get to how many. Okay, right one. Yeah, the lighting this is isn't perfect in here, the but. First, the first row. Yeah. This is the first row. This yeah. is the second row. Goring <clears throat> sat right at the uh, the, the beginning of the prisoner's dock. Mm -hmm. You go uh, Goring, Hess, you know, Ribbon Trial. Oh, so you got them in order, huh? Yeah. yeah. Now, the, uh, the military men, uh, the generals, were they uh, a little different? Were they more arrogant? Because here you are, just an American private, or uh, yeah. uh, and and here you you you're the, you're their boss now. Yeah. Yeah. They. Uh, well, let me tell you, the, the two prisoners were uh, 
uh, Field Marshal Keitel and Alfred Yodel, Yodel represented the whole of the, the Wehrmacht. German Army. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Field Marshal Keitel was more or less commander in chief of the German Army. Of course, Hitler was a supreme commander, right. naturally. Right. Right. When they received the verdict, the military men, when they received the verdict, which was death by hanging, mm -hmm. they uh, they didn't they didn't reject the hang the, the death uh, the method they didn't reject the the death sentence but the method of execution they wanted changed so through their lawyer they went to the court and they said through their lawyer they said we are professional soldiers mm -hmm. all all their lives they were professional Prussian soldiers in the German army Junkers. we only yeah. right yeah. right. We uh, we uh, followed orders and obeyed our orders. We are not criminals. We are soldiers, and we would like the method of execution changed from hanging to a firing squad, mm -hmm. which is an honorable death. Compared you to hanging, hang, yeah. you only hang criminals and spies criminals, usually. Yeah. yeah. So we're not criminals. We're soldiers. Mm -hmm. We want to be executed by a firing squad. Mm -hmm. And the courts turned around and said, you are not soldiers, you are criminals, and you will hang as criminals. Mm. And they did. Mm. They hung as criminals. So right after the, um, the hangings, that's when you had another assignment. I, I, when the uh, hangings took place, I uh, tried out for the 1st Division Army Band, mm -hmm. and naturally I passed. Mm -hmm. And I finished up my career in the service with the 1st Division Army there. That's great. Well, thank you so much for giving us your time. This is an incredible story from, you know, a first-hand experience. So, uh, God bless you. And there's been some articles written about you. So, if uh, people want to learn more, I guess you can just put your name oh, on, yeah. a, on a search engine and they could probably find... Um, well, uh, yeah, oh yeah. And yeah. find some articles. So, great. Thank look, you. Look up Nuremberg Trials. William H. Glenny or Shoah. Uh, Steven Spielberg, uh, I, I got interviewed by Steven oh, Spielberg. Oh, did you? Yeah. You know, he, he interviewed about 45,000 people. Just, wow. I don't want the Holocaust to ever be forgotten. Mm -hmm. And uh, look up Shoah and look up William Glenn. Shoah in Hebrew it's means genocide. Holocaust. Oh, yeah. Genocide or Holocaust. So, yeah. 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 Yeah, well, sorry. thank you so much. Oh, that's All right. right. God bless you. God bless you.